Hello, Dr. Jerome here, and welcome back to our class in Conflict and Mediation. Today we'll be discussing Chapter 2 from our wonderful textbook by Joyce Hawker and Willie Wilmot. I've never met him, but I had a professor in graduate school that knew him very well and always called him Willie. And I thought, that, that's just wrong. It's William Wilmot, right? Aren't professors supposed to be called by formal names? Well, I guess not, so I'll call him Willie, uh, though I haven't met him. This chapter gives us kind of a big picture of conflict and really I'm asking you to take a look at yourself in this chapter. A little deeper in the book we'll actually do a, a quick easy test to, to try to identify your primary conflict style. But at this point I just want you to stand back, look at yourself in regard to conflict and we'll cover several aspects of conflict, uh, you know, looking at it from different angles, circling around it. You've seen this in the movies now. It's a very popular shot where two people are having an intense conversation and they actually have the camera on some sort of rail and it just spins around the people that are talking right in the middle to give you every angle on, on what's going on. So that's essentially what we're doing today. Okay, as we go through, I'll probably replace this pic of the cat and the dog fighting uh, as our main image for conflict. I, I'm very aware that images are symbolic and I try to pick images for the slides that uh, symbolize the concept we're talking about. And so we'll probably replace this. But right now, many of you, this is probably where you're at and how you view conflict. Two very different people here in a conflict that has turned ugly uh, because it can't be resolved by more civilized means. Okay, the first thing our book talks about is, is attachment styles. And it discusses two different kinds, secure attachment and insecure attachment. And what we're talking about is your attachment as a small child to probably your mother, your primary caregiver. Sometimes it's a father, sometimes an aunt, sometimes a foster home, but that primary caregiver, and did you attach well with them? And the book points out that, uh, well, it's an interesting study that was done. On, it's called a longitudinal study where they looked at the same participants at age one and looked at what goes on in their house and then looked at them again at age 16 and then again at about age 21 or 22. Yeah, you lose track of some of them, so you want to start with a, a hundred or so and, uh, you know, it pairs down to 50 by the time they're in their 20s, but this is the most powerful kind of study in my view to look at. And what they found here was that uh, babies that had strong attachment with their primary caregiver uh, just dealt with conflict in a lot better ways while they were, you know, at by age 16, their teenage years, and then into their early adult years. And the kids that had an insecure attachment because of uh, all the things that can go wrong in a family uh, did not handle conflict as well. It was something they uh, just didn't do well. And the, the encouraging thing here I saw in the study was that once you become aware of this, and they found that the kids at age 16 that started becoming aware and trying to make themselves into better people, by age 21, within a few years, they were much more satisfied with how conflict happened in their lives and how uh, they managed it. I think that's an important thing to look at going uh, right up front here is that how you handle conflict can be changed and it can be made more positive. The workplace is another uh, area where we learn how to have conflict, probably more as adults. Uh, how many of you started work at age 16 or 17? My first job was at age 15 and you know I didn't have much conflict then, I was just told what to do. But as you continue in your work career and you become uh, more stable in a career or in a line of work, you start having your own ideas about how things ought to be and how you want to be treated, then conflict begins to happen. And uh, in your workplace or in your career, in your kind of the kind of line of work you're in, is conflict encouraged or is it suppressed? I was in construction in my early years and conflict was not suppressed. People usually talked things through, and, but once in a while people uh, did not, uh, and there, there were fist fights on the job actually, 
uh, which you know I consider a very immature way to try to resolve conflict. Uh, we learn to do that at a very young age and never mature out of it sometimes. But conflict was encouraged here in the university. Uh, conflict is encouraged, but people are also encouraged to talk about it, to talk out their views, usually at a table in a meeting with a lot of people listening. I don't often see two colleagues at each other's throats in somebody's office or in the hallway. But our conflict happens right out in the open on, in conference rooms. It is encouraged in the university system. We aren't encouraged to bury conflict. Though a lot of workplaces, yeah, don't, 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 what do they call it? Don't ruffle the feathers, don't stir up the water, whatever it is. Uh, conflict is suppressed. So how you handle it at these, this young age uh, is uh, paramount to how you're going to probably handle it as an adult, but you can change. Now I've added this slide. This is not from the textbook, but this is, you'll remember this from your Psych 101 course that you took, Classical Condition and Operant Conditioning. And it's my view that these two processes that psychologists have widely accepted as uh, valid descriptions of how human behavior occurs are very prevalent in how we manage conflict. And of course you remember uh, classical conditioning is the neutral stimulus occurs before the real event. So that was Pavlov's dog. Ring the bell, then give the dog the food, and uh, after a short time all you had to do is ring the bell and the dog would start drooling for the food even before the dog could smell the food. Normally it's the smell of the food that causes the drooling. They switched it over to ringing the bell. Now think of that idea in terms of conflict. Uh, you're young. Mom and dad. Dad comes home from work or mom comes home from work. Somebody's late. Where have you been? Well, I was just out with some of my friends. Well, you're out awfully late with some of your friends. And, and uh, you, as a child, you're sitting back watching this and you know what's coming. You've seen it a dozen times, a hundred times. Mom and dad are going to get in a knockdown, drag out fight before it's over, and dad's going to punch mom again. Of course, that doesn't happen to every family, but all that has to happen is dad didn't come home on time. There's the stimulus. Nobody's punched anybody yet. You haven't heard a raised voice or seen anything violent, or and you can just tell by mom's attitude as the evening wears on, the dad's late. And here's a neutral stimulus in a sense that occurs before the event and already you as a child are getting upset because you know what's coming. Even though you haven't thought it all the way through, the whole house just gets tense. Okay, operant conditioning is the reward or punishment occurs after the event. And uh, this also affects us as well especially as we start becoming involved in conflicts and uh, conflict happens, it's uh, just a game on the playground as a child and you don't get what you want, another kid isn't getting what they want and uh, we have a conflict and the reward or punishment is, oh you work it out, that's a nice reward or you get what you want, that's a nice reward and if that usually happens then your attitude about conflict probably becomes more positive. I don't mind engaging in conflict because I get what I want. And you may not realize it at age four, but it's because you're half a head taller than another kid. And they're just a little intimidated because maybe the other kid has bigger brothers and sisters that bully him or her. So the reward or punishment occurs before or after. And the kid that's maybe a little shorter or that has brothers and sisters that push them around, uh, on the playground then the punishment is usually what happens uh, after the conflict and we learn we learn that conflict situations I usually get the short end of the stick here how come I always uh, have to uh, give up what I want and everybody else gets what they want and and we develop an attitude well this would be the operant conditioning and what these psychologists have taught us is that it runs deep and it runs subconsciously. It just happens and we're not really cognitively thinking these things through. We develop a conflict style uh, helped along by these processes uh, that often is not healthy for us. Okay, let's move on. I just kind of added this in. It occurred to me as I was reading through the chapter and uh, just ponder these things. 
I won't ask you any quiz questions on this. All right. Now our perspectives on conflict, uh, we have three different systems. Uh, you can see this guy's hand here, what kind of conflict system he's got. The tiger tattooed right on his fist. Uh, and the three systems are avoidant, collaborative, or aggressive. And uh, I'm looking at page 39 of our ninth edition text. If you bought the older edition, uh, look around, you'll find the same chart there in chapter 2. Uh, but avoidant systems, and these, these are like overall approaches to conflict, probably coming from within a family or a workplace. And uh, look at these bullet points there. Conflict doesn't exist. If it does, don't recognize it. We're avoiding conflict. We don't want conflict. We don't like it. Don't tell anybody if there's a conflict. Walk away if something starts brewing. Don't raise your voice. People who typically avoid conflict, take that whole approach to avoiding it. Um, these bullet points describe you pretty well. A collaborative system, well let me jump down to an aggressive system. Uh, survival of the fittest. Be brutally honest regardless of the impact. Establish your position early. If somebody attacks you, you have the right to fight back, or you have to fight back. And people who don't engage you, they're just weak. Run over them. We're right back to social Darwinism, that the right of the stronger to rule the weaker. Okay, the third system then is the collaborative system. Uh, this one's a more mature system. You may have been blessed to be in a family that handle conflict collaboratively. And uh, you learned these patterns at a young age. Most of us did not. Most of us have dysfunctional families. A movie you may have seen recently called uh, August Osage County with Julia Roberts and Benedict Cumberbatch and some other, uh, I think a few other well-known actors and actresses. It's a remake of a play, uh, but it's about a dysfunctional family. My wife and I watched that movie and as we were walking out I thought to myself and told her, this has got to be the feel-good movie of the year. I watched that family's problems and I feel good about my own family's life. And I had it pretty good actually, even though we had divorce, we had conflict, we had problems. But the point here is, you know, everybody's family typically has dysfunction in it to some degree. We hide it from the rest of the world, we're embarrassed by it, but we're all the same. And I think as you mature you start recognizing that in your friends. And these people you become best friends with, they see it in you and you see it in them that you have similar problems and similar struggles and you choose to help one another out rather than continue to hide them. A collaborative family is probably more rare. A collaborative workplace is probably more rare, though if you get a good mature boss you'll have that. Have meetings or mealtime chats to discuss issues. Deal with people directly. Use good listening skills. Say openly what you are feeling. Help is offered to resolve conflicts. Regular interaction is important. Dirty tricks not allowed. Strong feelings are normal and are allowed. Okay, so what kind of person are you? Uh, avoidant, collaborative, aggressive? Remember these are overall views. We'll get to some particular styles in uh, as we look at conflict in a later chapter. But for now just start thinking about these things. Okay, worldviews on conflict can be negative or positive, uh, a worldview, English doesn't have a good word for this. English is not a good language for philosophy. Uh, German is a much better language for philosophy, so is Greek. That's why Greeks invented it and some of the leading philosophers throughout history have been German. Most philosophy was conducted in Latin uh, throughout history and Latin's not a bad language for it. Not that I speak all these, I just have learned these things. I, I have studied Greek. Worldviews of conflict, though, a, a gestalt, that's I think the German word for a worldview. Uh, even a, a paradigm would be more of a Greek word for it. You may have heard these terms. But it's just, how does your brain process and handle what you see out in the world there? And you have a whole set of beliefs, truths, foundational truths, assumptions sometimes. Other times the truth comes handed down to you from uh, family, tradition, culture, uh, religion and we have this whole set of truths and we look at the world and we logically analyze and judge it. This is our worldview. Our worldview about conflict can be negative. Often uh, this comes from I think problems uh, as you are in childhood and your early years of work. 
Uh, and, and we get some childish views about philosoph or philosophies about um, conflict here. And I'm looking at um, a section called Negative Views of Conflict. And uh, just listen to some of these sayings. These sayings have truths in them that you're supposed to learn as a child to uh, live in the world properly. And, and here they are. Pick on somebody your own size. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Hey, we teach kids these things, don't we? Don't hit girls. Don't rock the boat. Children should be seen and not heard. Act your age, which means act my age, not your age. Be a man and fight back. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. There's a lot of philosophy embedded in this. The book says there's a little, there's a bit of philosophy. I say there's a lot of philosophy embedded here. And we hear these sayings that have a little bit of rhyme to them or have some visual metaphor like rocking the boat. And if you've ever been in a little uh, rowboat with a few friends out on the lake and somebody starts messing around, you know what I mean. It's, it's an excellent metaphor. And there is elements of truth in this. And these philosophies err on the side of caution. And with conflict, uh, perhaps we've had to do that because people have such a negative view of conflict and when conflict does happen people can get hurt and so we try to overcompensate in our philosophy. A healthier mature view of a civilized educated person uh, will look at conflict much more neutrally or even positively as you uh, get good with your conflict skills. All right, some of these negative views, conflict is abnormal, we shouldn't have it. When, when there's conflict the, we've got to just resolve this quickly because it's wrong and it's abnormal. Some people say this what we have here is a failure to communicate. Well no, conflict is not a failure to communicate. I think we have very few failures to communicate especially when you take in the fact that nonverbal communication comprises oh 66 percent in the lowest estimates up to 93 percent in the high ones of total communication it's nonverbal. We know when somebody's upset at us, when they've treated us a little bit differently. They send meta messages to us that indicate where our relationship stands and who's who to whom. And we get it. We know there's a problem, but people aren't talking about it because, and that's where this idea of a failure to communicate. No, we're communicating all the time, and you know there's a problem. Anger is the right emotion for conflict. Well, no, anger is an emotion that happens after frustration and frustration happens when uh, for a number of reasons. So frustration might be more normal in conflict when communication isn't happening, when you feel you're not being heard, when you feel your goals, your uh, privileges, your rights, your, uh, your personhood is being dissed in some way, we start to feel frustrated. Well, that's because we're not working on resolving the conflict yet. Once people start listening to you and uh, looking at it from your perspective a little bit, even if you're not going to get what you want in the conflict, don't you feel so much better that at least my boss understands my issue here? Uh, conflict is win or lose. Well, it shouldn't be that way. We should try to find solutions to the conflict where both parties uh, are satisfied with what has happened and that comes through collaborative conflict resolution or uh, using a, a tactic of compromise to reach solutions. But it's not win or lose. It is with immature children and uh, very few children have learned to uh, share their toys. And it's something we try to teach uh, but many kids don't get the lesson and many adults still don't get it and win or lose conflict is the norm. Some positive views on conflict uh, are slightly different, you know, and, and I come from a place where conflict was avoided in my family. I avoided conflict most of my life, and when I didn't avoid it as a teenager, uh, it turned into fist fights, and as I matured, I quit doing that and handling conflict that way and decided to just avoid because I didn't want to hit somebody or punch somebody, and I didn't think that was a good way to resolve conflict, but I didn't know any other way, so I avoided after that. These healthy views though, which are more difficult for me to really grasp and have been, and, and you know, it's been a learning process as I've matured, and I'm still maturing by the way, 
Uh, but conflict is inevitable. It's just going to happen, and it's not abnormal. It, it's inevitable, and it is normal and natural. People have different goals. There's always scarce resources. Uh, we perceive things wrongly. Uh, people will interfere with your goals, and these, you know, we have these general issues that are just natural and part of human life. Another positive view is that conflict actually gets the problems out on the table and gets you looking for solutions. That is a positive step. And even if you cannot, and you know, one out of five, one out of six conflicts probably can't be resolved to people's satisfaction. Uh, but even so, just getting it out on the table and trying to understand the other person's perspective uh, helps you reach a decision about what you can do about it. But it is, it brings problems to the table and many of them get resolved to everybody's satisfaction once you begin negotiating, conversing, arbitrating, uh, adjudicating even. Conflict helps people join together. It clarifies goals. Now, if you have a conflict with a coworker and the two of you work out a resolution to it that everybody's happy with, you're probably going to become have a lot more respect for that person and them for you. And uh, your future conflicts will probably, hey, let's sit down and talk about this and solve it because you have had a satisfying resolution incident, let's call it. Clarifying your goals in conflict. Sometimes that's enough that, look, I, my boss, I tell my boss I'm underpaid. My boss says, I know you're underpaid. I, I hate this situation. We'll do what we can. You know, it doesn't add anything to my paycheck, but I feel better about it rather than my boss, no, we don't discuss that. Read your contract. Get out of my office. I'm not getting that kind of response, which would frustrate me. And even though I don't necessarily get what I want right away, uh, I feel better that my boss is on my side and really is trying, and I know these are tough times and the budget's tight, and everybody always needs more money because of inflation, and you're going to get me on a rant about the economy here, and we won't go there. Okay, conflict clears resentment and brings understanding. I think we've covered that a little bit with people joining together. Once you've resolved conflict, uh, relationships get much stronger. Metaphors are very important. And this is a, a section of the chapter that really hasn't changed since I think the second edition of the book that I used in college. And, uh, but it is interesting. And you just have to analyze yourself and look at your own life here, your own mind. How do you talk about conflict? And the words you choose in, when you talk about something, and I'm one of those that teaches that words shape the way you think. And once you adopt a vocabulary about a certain aspect of life, that vocabulary shapes your conclusions, your thought, your philosophy, and everything about it. Changing your words changes your attitude, changes your actions. It starts with words. We do not think without words. Without them, uh, we are communicating non-verbally and probably much more like uh, animals than human beings. And it's what sets us above uh, the animal kingdom is our ability, our to use a language. Not that other species do not have their own language, but it's not, you, you can't do philosophy uh, with nonverbal communication. It doesn't work too well. And so we have this language and we need to recognize how powerfully language shapes us. Take a linguistics class, uh, take some upper level communication courses and you can really get into some solid theory on this. I'll just make the assertion here, please trust me on that one. When we have metaphors, and metaphors are when we take a simple idea to help us understand the complex one. Conflict is war. Well, if you believe that and talk about it that way, uh, he shot down all my arguments. I hit him where it hurts. We start conceiving of conflict that way, and we engage in conflict that way. You've got to change the way you talk about it and actually say the right things out loud. Now, conflict's more of a balancing act or, or a, a dance. You know, these metaphors aren't as graphic necessarily or as uh, romantic as war and a trial and natural disasters like a hurricane or bullying a mess or a uh, game starts to get a little bit healthier at the bottom of the list here, but even a game and game theory thinks win or lose, and we really don't want to think of conflict as win or lose. 
but the balancing act, a bargaining table. Uh, I kind of like the garden metaphor uh, this year after I've been working out in the garden all summer. Dang, that's a lot of work. Preparing the soil in the spring, uh, getting stuff planted, and then all of the problems with hailstorms and heavy winds and trying to protect my poor little plants. And then remembering to go out and tend the garden, pull the weeds out of it. There's a uh, winds blew around in the midsummer and planted seeds everywhere and then the rains came and I had weeds all over. I had to pull out all the weeds and we got a successful crop of tomatoes. This is Flagstaff by the way and I only tried to plant one thing this year and they're pretty good tomatoes but dang it was a lot of work. So I kind of like the garden metaphor. Uh, it's not just uh, traipsing around with your little clippers and plucking a weed or two. Gardens are a lot of work. Uh, the quilt metaphor implies people working together to build something bigger than you could ever do on your own in that amount of time. Plus, you get a lot of friendship and, con and contact with people as you go. Improvisational music, well, if you're a musician, uh, I'm not sure I like that metaphor uh, because um, improv really, you have to be really proficient at what you do, and even people that are good at improv usually just have a whole series of 20 or 30 different riffs they had learned on their instrument that they patch together in a different way every time uh, the band director points at you and says take it away uh, you're just putting together things you've practiced in your bedroom over and over and over and it sounds like it's all original and new and it's really not but uh, you'll get me in a rant on music here in a minute um, I, I like to listen to that but improv is really not what we think it is. So I think I like this garden metaphor the best. Maybe you like a dance metaphor. And dancing's difficult. It's a lot of work. It tires you out. It's very rewarding. It's fun. It takes some skill. You have to learn a few steps. That's what this class is about. Learning your dance steps. Learning your improv riffs, if you like, that you can uh, use as needed. Argumentation is the same thing. Learning argument formulas and how to plug data for each situation into an argument formula and then the formula is what uh, helps you uh, have a foundation for arguments you're making okay so try to identify your metaphors how do you talk about conflict catch yourself in the act and just start telling yourself as you walk around a campus or walk from your car into work or whatever that no conflicts like a a garden and start thinking about gardening and what it takes. Or go plant a garden and think about conflict as you uh, work on your garden uh, every day. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. I, I know this is a longer lecture, but this has been a pretty deep chapter and I want to give you your money's worth, right? The Lynn's model of conflict I think is helpful here. We want to look at conflict from your perspective and try to go grab the lens of your other party in the conflict and look at it through their perspective as well. A lens is like a set of glasses and they can correct for one type of vision or they correct for another, but not both. Other lenses bring things into focus, usually a couple of lenses are required to do that. Uh, so this is kind of a nice metaphor if you like. Conflict is like looking through a lens Oh, uh, maybe lens model is a better way to think of this. Uh, now we're getting towards how do you start getting an understanding of conflict and resolving it. Well, look at it from your perspective. Look at it from the other people's perspective. And if there's three or more, four or more people in a conflict, everybody has their own perspective on it. They're looking through their own lenses. You, as the person with a college degree, having taken an upper level class in conflict and mediation, and, by the way, if I may digress, you can get a master's degree in conflict mediation. Uh, Syracuse University has a wonderful program. Uh, other universities, uh, Arizona State probably has one. I'm not sure about NAU here yet. But there are excellent programs in conflict and mediation that get you right into a career because you know, it's one of those careers where we're always going to need people that help other people who are more immature resolve conflict. Look at the conflict through everybody's lenses and try to understand what's going on, understand it from their perspective. Now a key idea here, I want to talk about attribution errors. I first learned about these from I think version two or three of the textbook. Here we are and the authors have really dropped this idea out of the textbook and I don't think they should have, so I want to talk about it a bit. Attribution errors happen 
when we attribute your behavior to something. When I look at you and attribute your behavior to something. Now I'm looking at these students here in the classroom and they're all falling asleep, barely staying awake, and I'm trying to attribute, why is the class falling asleep while I lecture? Stupid lazy freshmen, they didn't go get any sleep last night, they're up till 2 a.m. partying and having a good time, and then they drag into my 9 a.m. class and their uh, breakfast is worn off and they're getting sleepy by 10 o'clock. And so I attribute the behavior to their disposition, their character. It's something about them. When they look at me, and they're up there opening their half-closed eyelids now and then, and I'm standing there lecturing to a camera, and maybe you're on the couch falling asleep and dozing off right now, and they're looking at my behavior as the lecturer, and what, what they see is I'm sleepy because this guy is boring. He can't hold my attention. And this person throws it back on me and looks at my disposition, my characteristics as a lecturer. And both of us are probably making errors. And to avoid these attribution errors, and this is what looking at lenses is all about, I've got to look at my own lecturing skill through their lens. Am I a boring lecturer? Am I dragging this point on and on? Uh, am I monotone? Yes, I have a tendency to be monotone. It's something I've had to try to correct after I started becoming a communication person. And so I've got to be more dynamic. I have to talk about interesting and practical things and not drone on and on about theory and dates and people's names that you're going to forget anyway. And so I've got to do better as a lecturer if I want to hold your attention. The students there, you know, maybe they really should have gotten a little more sleep. Yeah, he's kind of a boring lecturer, but why can't this is important information and you are going to get boring lecturers in college. Why can't the students get a little more sleep? You shouldn't stay up till 2 a.m. I used to stay out late every night and my boss at work finally set me down for one of those conflict talks. Wasn't much conflict to it. He told me, you've got to get some sleep at night and come here to work ready to go or we're going to let you go. He didn't need to say the last part, he just told me to get some sleep. So attribution errors happen because I have a pervasive tendency when I look at you to blame it on you, to blame it on your character, your disposition. But when I turn around and look at myself, well, it, it's it's the situation. I have to lecture through this material. You've got to learn it. You, you have to learn all the theories. And I look at the constraints on me that come from the outside. I don't look at my disposition as a lecturer. I look at my external features. I look at you internally. I look at me externally. But when you look at me, you're looking at my internal junk. And uh, you are not looking at the uh, external things that are pressuring me as a lecturer, like I've got a campus committee that has learning objectives and they do assessment of the class and they test you and evaluate you to see if I taught you the things I was supposed to teach, things other people chose for me. And maybe I'm lecturing on things I really don't want to lecture about, but I have to because of the administration. You can look at any conflict like this. Why did you show up late for work? Well, you overslept, you lazy bum. Well, really, my car doesn't run that well and I had to get a ride from a friend today because you don't pay me enough to buy a new car. External versus internal. These are what attribution error is about and looking through these various lenses helps us to grasp this. So attribution errors occur when you look at me you're going to tend to say it's because of my disposition. When you look at yourself you're going to tend to say well it's, it's his, this fault of this, it's over here, it's not my fault. Humans do that. We're just being human. Okay, final slide here. Um, filters. We have these filters working. I'm not sure filters are the right word. This gets more back to a worldview, perhaps. But uh, let's look at gender and culture. Well, we can start with self esteem. Uh, people who have high self esteem uh, tend to be overconfident as they get older. Uh, people with low self-esteem need to develop that confidence as they mature. People with high self-esteem as a youngster 
probably need to tone it down a little bit. Well, self-esteem is good, but overconfidence is bad. So we tend to think we can do no wrong when we have high self-esteem at age 14 to 22. Uh, by 25, we get upset with ourselves, even depressed, because we have failures in life, because we were overconfident and tried to do something that was outside of our skill set. Low self-esteem holds us back, and as we mature, we learn that, oh, you can do this. Hopefully in college you're learning that. You're gaining a skill set and you're learning that you are smart, you are competent and capable, and you are able to take on bigger and bigger things until you find where your, your skills or your abilities meet their match. And uh, then you'll have to learn to either become a better person or be satisfied in, in that spot. Okay, gender filters. Uh, central one I can talk about here is Let's think in terms of two term, two ideas here. Uh, one is uh, the idea that everybody should be equal. Women tend to live their lives from a place where they look at everybody and want connection. They want egalitarian relationships. They want friendships that, that are equal in nature. And all of their communication once you have that view, now a lot of men have that view too. These are two big overlapping circles, but research has found that women tend, overwhelmingly tend, 70-80% of the time, to look at other people and think uh, we're equals. And I want a relationship with you as a friend, as an equal, and we share our problems with one another. We, we talk about solutions together, sure, but let's share problems first. Let's understand one another. Let's build the friendship. Men take a more asymmetrical view of relationships, and men live in these worlds of hierarchy, one up and one down. I'm a little bit better at football than you. Well, you're better at basketball than me. Okay, men do build egalitarian, symmetrical relationships where we see ourselves as equals, but by and large our world comes from a place where experience, expertise, uh, age, ability, we use these factors, these facts about ourselves to set up a pecking order within various social situations. The pecking order tends to carry across somebody who's older, an older male or even an older woman who's successful and has experience and wisdom, a younger person who's still starting their career will tend to defer and let them be that one-up position. But men live in this world of a pecking order. Women live in a world where everybody's equal. Yes, there are men that can have egalitarian relationships and vice versa. I'm not putting a hard distinction here. Uh, that doesn't exist. But those are tendencies the research has found. When it comes into conflict, though, having this one-up pecking order type perspective on life tends to push you towards a win-lose uh, I want to get what I want because I'm better than you, view of conflict. Whereas the more equality type friendship world, you want to work things out, maintain the friendship. It's not about winning or losing. Yeah, let's solve the problem, but let's maintain the friendship in the solving of it. Doesn't always work out, but that's the goal. Cultural filters come into play here as well. Uh, the one the book talks the most about is collectivism or individualism. Americans, Norwegians, British, other European countries tend to be very individualistic. It's all about me, what my rights, my life, my goals, and it's okay for me to put my interests first above everybody else's. That's the individualistic worldview. The collectivist worldview says it's about the group. It's about all of us in a family, in a community, in a nation, surviving and prospering together as a group. Well, you can see exactly how these kinds of deep assumptions about how life is affect the way you have conflict. In a collectivist culture, we're probably going to downplay conflict, not want to engage in it, especially if we're not good at it. And we want what's best for the group, and we don't really want to have conflicts because they can tear a group, they can tear friendships apart when you don't have the skills to manage the conflict properly. If you're in that 
individualist culture, yeah, let's, it's on. Let's argue. Let's, let's solve this thing and I'm going to win and you're going to lose. That tends to tear relationships apart, but that doesn't matter to us because we're individualists and I get the promotion and you don't. And if you end up quitting the company, that's fine with me. It doesn't matter. I'm not too worried about the collective group here. So these filters have a strong bearing on how we engage in conflict. Be aware of those. If you're a woman that tends to think more male-like and you, that pecking order at work is important and real in your life, recognize that about yourself. If you're a man who tends to be more egalitarian, have more symmetrical, equal relationships, recognize that about yourself as well. Understanding yourself and your own perspectives is what are the key idea in this chapter here and what I want you to get. Because as we move into the chapters where we begin developing skills at resolving conflict, you need to know what your strengths are and where your challenge areas are going to be. So really do some self-examination here as you read this chapter. All right, uh, thanks a lot for listening. I use this picture on the end of a lot of my slides. I really like it and it's called the Bond of Union. You can just look up that image if you want a, a detailed pic of it. But it's two people that are kind of made of each other, yet they're separate, yet they're intertwined and linked together. And I think it just really grasps uh, the nature of human relationships very well in a very symbolic form. In conflict, yeah, we are bound together. We have conflicts because we're interdependent. We need each other. We need each other to survive and have a more prosperous life for everybody. And so, but conflict's going to happen. And so we're, maybe the balancing act is that nice metaphor all the way through here. Think about these things deeply, and we'll talk to you in our next lecture in Chapter 3.